So it is my pleasure to introduce our first session under medical diagnosis and research of the MSRGN's Genetic Summit 2022. Our speaker is Dr. David Viscachel, who is a professor of pediatrics and clinical geneticist with the Division of Medical Genetics at the University of Utah Health Center. His talk is entitled Implementation of Sponsored Clinical Trials by Genetic Providers. Please, for a complete bio, visit the attendees' website. Also, please reference your screen for CEU accreditation, uh, the disclosure statements, and again, our learning objectives for this particular presentation, as well as visit the attendee website at the CEU tab as well. At this time, Dr. Viscacho, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Janet, that was great. And, and thanks also for reminding me that I've been here at the University of Utah for some <laughs> 30 odd years, just to let people know that uh, I, I came here as a pediatric resident and uh, stayed on and did my fellowship under John Kerry and uh, Ray White was my uh, basic research mentor. But I would never have dreamed when I finished the uh, clinical fellowship that I would have been able to participate in um, clinical trials. Um, I thought that might have been for the metabolic geneticists, the biochemical geneticists, but not necessarily clinical geneticists. And so over this 30 some odd years, um, there are opportunities that have popped up. And I think for the um, sake of our families, perhaps um, sake of our interest that we have, each, each one of us gets somewhat tuned into, well, let's take it a step further from diagnosis and see if we can't make a difference in these families' lives. And so this is uh, implementation of sponsored um, clinical trials. And I think many of us recognize now the cost of, of, of putting on a clinical trial goes beyond what NIH, and I would say even the Department of Defense can provide. So um, we are looking, when I think of sponsored clinical trials, I'm really thinking of, of uh, industry and, and pharma supporting that. But I wanted to point out, I definitely wanted to acknowledge that um, when you get into clinical trials as a clinical geneticist, you better have a daggone good clinical research coordinator. And I have to point out, Carrie Bailey has been here for some 20, the 20 years that I've been working on clinical trials, she's been... Uh, my right-hand person. So with that, let's move forward to my disclosures, which these are just potential conflicts of interest. I'm just, um, I'll be bringing up different um, industry-supported trials um, only for um, examples and not, um, not for really bringing out the products. And so I really don't have any disclosures. And the objectives that I've put forward for you all is that I, I hope at the end of our 30 minutes, you'll be able to outline some of the basic principles of a clinical trial, especially with respect as you're thinking through the clinical trials. And what does it mean to have a genetic disorder and go into a clinical trial? So these are not trials for hypertension or some of the more common conditions, diabetes, let's say. When you have a genetic disorder, um, there's, there's a difference, I think, in these clinical trials. And then I'd like you to provide an example for recruitment issues. These are, these are um, one of the key reasons I think sponsors come to us and say, would you be interested in putting on a clinical trial at your site? Um, it's really primarily for recruitment issues. So I wanted to say a little bit in the first third, so I'll break this up into thirds. There'll be bench to bedside where we just talk about how discovery leads to effective targeted treatments. And then I'll, I'll go into the more boring side of things, but what is a clinical trial? How do you even think about performing them? And then I wanted to finish up at the end, just sharing my experiences over two decades for a few of the clinical trials that I thought were seminal in my, my career. So, so this should be really um, entitled that uh, if we were to say from discovery to effective targeted treatments through clinical trials. And I just wanted to bring up a few examples. And a key one 
was um, the the um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that um, really took hold in the early um, 2000s. So right at the turn of the centennial. So the um, and the, but there's a it will go through that and and then I'll talk a little bit about the um, recombinant enzyme replacement therapy and the the key finding with respect to mannose 6-phosphate and what role that plays. And then I'll transition to something that's closer to home for me, and that's just the idea of going from uh, gene discovery to finally having an FDA-approved um, product that can be distributed to our families. So the first example is the development of imatinib. So this is a um, tyrosine um, kinase inhibitor as a therapeutic agent for chronic myelogenous leukemia. So people who have been practicing for a while remember that this was a key um, a, a key moment, I think, in oncology. And, and I think we recognize that um, it could apply to other things as well. But um, we have to go back even beyond the, the late 1990s, back to 1960 when um, cytogeneticists were recognizing that if you looked at white blood cells from somebody who had CML, that there was an unusual looking chromosome in many of those individuals. And Janet Raleigh in 1973 was able to show that there was a Philadelphia chromosome. And I'll try to bring up a pointer so I can point this out. So the, the, the chromosome abnormality was proven to be uh, a 922 balanced translocation. So this was in 1973. And uh, it took almost um, another 20 years before we could molecularly define what was so important about this translocation. And what was defined was that the BCR combined as a fusion with ABL, which is the tyrosine kinase, to lead to constitutive expression of the tyrosine kinase in those cells. So that led to um, a concerted effort to say, well, how can we inhibit um, ABL as a tyrosine kinase? And what is represented on the left side of the screen is the imatinib, which took a long time to develop, and how it actually inhibits the tyrosine kinase by popping out this loop right here and preventing um, um, the tyrosine kinase from activating downstream um, signals to um, propagate the cell and prevent apoptosis. So that's one example, and it really carried over. So in the early uh, 2000s, um, recognizing that tyrosine kinase, especially receptor tyrosine kinases, play a role in cancers, it really got the pharmaceutical industry going. And you can see that there's a number of, of um, pharmaceutical agents now that you can, you can target with um, different cell types that may have overexpression or activation of certain tyrosine receptors. Many of these are actually antibodies that block any of the um, growth factors that stimulate these. Now I'll transition over to something maybe closer to, to clinical geneticist, and that's the, um, the idea of, um, of treating those individuals with lysosomal storage disorders. And now, as many of you know, there's enzyme replacement therapy, and I'll point you to the right upper corner. This is ERT, enzyme replacement therapy. This little glob represents the enzyme, but it's important to realize that it must have a mannose 6-phosphate attached to it in order to in order for the mannose phosphate receptor to identify and bring the enzyme into the cell. So again, we have to go back to the 1970s when um, Elizabeth Neufeld um, identified that the individuals with eye cell disease, when they secrete um, lysosomal enzymes from their fibroblasts, they were not taken up by a normal fibroblast. And so there was a problem with the signal Recognizing that, Emil Kakis really worked hard with uh, MPS1 disorders and, and was able to synthesize a recombinant enzyme that had to have this mannose 6-phosphate from Chinese hamster ovary cells. And using that recombinant enzyme proved that uh, instead of being degraded in an in individual's serum, 
our plasma is, as it's um, given as an IV um, uh, replacement therapy, with that mannose 6-phosphate, it would um, go directly, it would target the, the cells and then get to the lysosomes and provide that enzyme that is missing in those individuals. So another seminal, um, I guess, um, example of showing how you go from discovery to the implementation of clinical trials. And then finally, this one that's closer to my heart is NF1, neurofibromatosis type 1. And this gene was, was cloned and sequenced in the early 1990s. And soon after the sequencing, it was known that there was a catalytic domain that uh, interacted with activated RAS to down-regulate um, RAS bound to GTP. It would stimulate the, um, the, the, uh, phos the, the loss of phosphorylation of GTP, go to GDP, and then become inactive. So I think we know that RAS is a, a very important oncogene and been known for a decade. And so this was pretty exciting news. And knowing how that fit in the pathway, at least within Schwann cells, the interest was to try to, to uh, develop um, inhibitors so that maybe those individuals with NF1 dealing with tumors, especially Schwann cell related tumors could then um, have reduction of, of growth. So there was a number of pathways that were trying to be targeted, including this, um, the pathway that, that leads the attachment of RAS to the inner membrane, and that were statins and farnesyl transferase inhibitors. But those weren't very effective. Um, they weren't very specific. It's been difficult to target RAS. Even um, 50 years later, it's still difficult to, to um, target RAS specifically. So the, the downstream signaling of RAS goes through a, a number of phosphorylation handoffs, I call it, to, to different proteins, including the ERK protein. And a focus over the last um, um, 10 years finally led to FDA approval of a MEK inhibitor for non-resectable symptomatic plexiform neurofibromas in children. So I... Hopefully we've seen that there's um, there's a way to go from discovery. So the uh, idea of research can eventually apply. And I think all of us think that, or all of us feel that the whole purpose for establishing a diagnosis is really to um, improve quality of life for those individuals through interventions if you can find them. So I want to switch gears and now talk about the trials themselves. And I want to put you in this position where you're um, providing a, um, a diagnosis. So this is a disclosure for a recent um, diagnosis. Perhaps it was exome uh, sequence analysis, and you're now sitting down with the families. And you know that there's a checklist that in your mind you've been following. You, you want to summarize the clinical manifestations to say, okay, does your child really fit this condition that's now been identified? And here we have molecular confirmation. This is the, the actual change, the, the variant that actually causes the, the uh, problem that leads to the phenotype. And then you'll talk a little bit about heritability and how it might be important for other family members. Maybe transition on to management. Are we going to have to follow things? Um, are there specific referrals to make? And then you'll provide some anticipatory guidance. And I would say 25, 30 years ago, that might be where it would have ended. But nowadays, you better be prepared for, okay, thanks for letting me know that this is what our child has, but what do we do? And so you now have to be prepared for um, uh, knowing what uh, potentially approved medications are available. And then I would surmise to say that you need to know a little bit about what's um, potentially available for clinical trials. And so just to give a few examples, so these are FDA-approved drugs that are in treatment of genetic disorders, and I think you can recognize some that you clearly probably have um, worked with your endocrinologist knowing that individuals with Turner syndrome, they can benefit from growth hormone replacement therapy. That's you know not necessarily um, just for individuals with genetic conditions, but it's, it went through the whole process of being FDA-approved, and then as new um, potential applications um, became available, then there are changes that the FDA makes in the label to enable 
that to be used for specific conditions. And I point out that um, a, a couple of um, just routine um, anti-cancer agents have been used for the optic nerve pathway tumors in NF1. So that's, uh, if you have a child with NF1 in your clinic, you want to be sure that they're seen by ophthalmology. So if they have a tumor that they and treatments available, they clearly get in to see the neuro-oncologist. Likewise, vigabitrin for seizures in um, infantile spasms. So vigabitrin is an anti-seizure agent that's used for many conditions. Um, but in TSC, it really seems to help the infantile spasms. And it makes a big difference if it started early on after diagnosis. And then even um, for PE and, and the android streaks that are found, um, in the um, in the retina, that uh, the the uh, ophthalmologist would initiate intra um, vitreal um, bevacizumab to to treat to decrease the vascular vascularization. So those drugs are available, readily available, and and have been applied to genetic conditions. But now you have to be thinking about targeted treatment. So once you know the 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 genetic um, change, you know the pathway that's involved. Now we start thinking about, well, let's use some targeted therapy so there's not the, um, what would be off-target um, side effects that might arise if you were using a broader um, treatment. And I just throw, I, I just put in a, a few conditions that, um, or a few uh, medications that you might use for different conditions. Everolimus is, has been effective. It's been shown to be effective for tuber sclerosis. Now, remember, these are all FDA approved. So they had to have gone through clinical trials. And this is, um, I think what I'm encouraging is um, at least think about participating in clinical trials if you have the wherewithal to do it and you have the interest. So in NF1, there's um, sirolimus, sirolimus, which is treatment for the plexiform neurofibromas. Of course, we know about the um, enzyme replacement therapy for non-CNS symptomatic attenuated MPS1. And then, um, of course, the, the one that you might really be um, excited about, or at least your newborn screening teams are going to be excited about, is making that early diagnosis for SMA1, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, so you can get this one-time treatment for all of the manifestations for SMA early, early on. One thing you'll see is I'm not going to talk much about gene therapy trials. That's a whole talk in itself, as you heard from Brendan Lee last year. Um, but we might have some discussion about that in the um, after the lecture here. So the other um, piece that you have to think about in that um, counseling session is what's available in clinical trials. Because, you know, the families are, are going to ask that same question, what's available to treat? And I just few, put up a few examples. You may not be aware that there are clinical trials for Fragile X syndrome, um, even for deletion 22 Q11.2 syndrome. This is um, something that you wouldn't necessarily think about as a, as a um, microdeletion condition, but it's always worth taking a look before you sign off on your counseling session. And then for NF1, this is a relatively new one. This is a treatment of the cutaneous neurofibromas with um, um, a MEK inhibitor that's in a gel, and that's an ongoing recruiting um, trial. So it's always worth to, to look it up. And now thinking about clinical trials that are in medical genetics, I just wanted to bring up five different points that we'll go through just to, to give you a sense of, of how how you, you would go forward, what you should be thinking about if um, a clinical trial is implemented at your site or if you become involved in some way. So we'll start with the goal of clinical trials. And the ultimate goal, you really want to hit a home run, right? That's the, to get FDA approval is, is the, the ultimate goal of, I think, any clinical trial that um, has taken a lot of effort. You'd also like to have a study drug that treats all manifestations of genetic disease, uh, essentially if you could come up with a cure, but um, we, we need to be thinking about treatment of whatever manifestations might be bothering the, the, the family the most who have that genetic condition. 
And just looking at this, I don't know if that's the Houston Astros playing the Philadelphia Phillies, but um, anyway, we know how that turned out for those of you from Texas. So here's a goal, a single pill for all symptoms. This was a uh, um, emphasized, Bruce Korf gave a talk and he emphasized this to our, um, at our NF group that um, our NF community, and it's unlikely that we'll have one pill to treat all of the manifestations for a condition with, with such a, um, a, a broad set of clinical, um, clinical features, clinical manifestations. So maybe there's a pill for learning problems, a pill for tibial dysplasia, and another for the neurofibroma. So we have to break it down into, into pieces. So, so the goals of, of what you hope to accomplish with the clinical trial really determine the, the type of trial, the type of clinical trial that you'll go forward with. And just to break this down, there are observational um, trials where it's a collection of, of individuals and trying to, to perhaps phenotype them a bit better so that you have a sense of natural history over time. And often th these observational trials will gather a cohort that will prepare that group for intervention. So if you have a better phenotype co cohort, you may have a better idea of what the endpoint selection might be. Once you decide that an intervention is, is appropriate for a condition, then there's the phase one, which is primarily a safety first um, exploration of that new agent that you're that you're trying. And, and this can be even a dose finding um, uh, phase one study so that you, you don't know what the appropriate dose is as you go from preclinical trials with mice models or any other model to, to now um, treating humans. And so this has a, a lot of pharma, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic um, components to it. And then transitioning, once you recognize that this is a safe medication to give, then you start thinking about the efficacy. And that's the phase two trial. And usually those are smaller trials. And, um, and if they appear safe, if the intervention is safe and effective, then you move on to a larger trial, a phase three, phase four trial, where it really becomes more of a real world experience. And there are many clinical trials that have done pretty well in phase two, but just crash in phase three. So it's not an easy thing to, to go through each of these uh, phased clinical trials, but extremely important as um, the, the regulatory agencies um, review the data with you. So there's a, another point I'd like to bring up, and that is clinical trials that are principal investigator initiated versus sponsor initiated. And I think these days, just given the expense of trials, a principal investigator can, can have an idea, can have experience in um, a, a particular condition, let's say, but they generally are not gonna go alone to move it to a clinical trial. And there needs to be support. And if you can get it, NIH has enough to, to do so for a pilot study, then um, it's worthwhile. But these days, I think that you, you need to connect and collaborate with the sponsor in some way. But once the sponsor has a hold of it, then as they reach out for recruitment and find other sites to carry on the clinical trial, that's where um, geneticists may get involved. And I'd have to point out that there are the whole purpose of the clinical trial is to get um, regulatory approvals, and FDA is the primary, um, um, I would say, the primary regulatory agency, at least here in the in the United States. So protocol development. I want to spend a minute or two on on protocol development. Is uh, this is this takes a fair amount of time. This is the going from discovery to effective treatment. So there's a concept and, and that needs assessment by multiple individuals, including who's going to sponsor um, that trial. So it's not just the principal investigator who has an idea, the sponsor also becomes involved of, in, in the concept of, is this an endeavor that um, anyone would want to sink time, energy, and 
of course, money into. And so developing a specific drug versus pulling one off the shelf and trying it on a different group of individuals is um, also fairly intricate in, in um, the development of a trial. Preclinical drug assessment, both in vitro studies and cells, as well as um, generally through the mouse modeling so that some PK um, information can be available really is um, sets the stage then for the design of a clinical trial with the protocol. And that takes the principal investigator and a whole team that um, looks at the logistics of carrying out that trial. And that involves the certifications at different sites, as well as clinical coordinators being available. Um, administrative um, side of institutions become involved at that point. But then we, we move on to truly really identifying what which sponsor will take on that trial. And the, they need input because many sponsors, many industry um, related sponsors don't have the, um, the sense of what this condition that they're providing a drug for is um, what it's actually treating. And so, this is where we need the collaborators, the statisticians, the consumers have to provide some input to, to really define what would be the endpoints and how this clinical trial is going to go forward with the protocol. So it's a, a group effort even before it gets off the ground and goes to the IRB for um, figuring out if, uh, if, if there's a balance for um, benefits versus risks. So here's where the genetics teams can, can select if they want to participate in a sponsored trial. And things to evaluate um, is really the expertise that individuals at your own institution have, what kind of um, um, academic center strengths there are for that particular site, are there clinics that are serving um, individuals with rare disorders? For example, prouder willie Syndrome Clinic, if you have a clinic, I can tell you that there's a lot of family members who are asking, why don't we have such and such clinical trial available here at our site? And um, you, you better be prepared to answer why it fits or it doesn't fit at, at um, your site for those sponsors that are coming forward. You have to have an availability of qualified clinical research coordinators to even think about taking on a trial. And this is where um, Carrie Bailey has been so helpful for our group here at the University of Utah. There's budgetary items that need to be negotiated. And of course, you, nowadays we think about uh, how can you carry out a clinical trial with um, uh, COVID um, rearing its ugly head periodically to, to diminish the or decrease the amount of um, time that people can um, come to the centers and uh, especially if there's a high rate of infection in your, in your local site. And then you really need to think, okay, we have the, we have the patients, let's say, and we have the, um, we, we have the, the, the wherewithal to carry it out. How about um, what's our next step? And, and here we're thinking about the different manifestations that you could treat. And now looking at um, the sponsored clinical trials, this just shows you even when you select a, a particular um, trial that you'd wanna do, there's many sponsors that you can look at. And here's four different sponsors that um, you might be considering for um, a trial with your um, clientele. And recruitment, eligibility, enrollment, valuable, um, valuable participants. These are all ideas that um, you need to keep in mind as you reach out to your, um, your families. And then the performance of the trial. There's data collection. You have to identify adverse events. There's protocol deviations that you have to keep track of. So there's a fair amount of paperwork. This is just an example of an adverse event form that needs to be filled out, regardless of if you think it has anything to do with the, the, um, the intervention or not. And protocol deviation forms, of course, you fill out for both um, patients as well as, as um, the carrying out of the trial with the investigators. <clears throat> 
And I'd like to finish up on the clinical trials with endpoints, endpoints, endpoints. That's the key, that's the key finding. And these are determined by experts, and hopefully we get participant reported outcomes um, included. Um, and this is just an example of the research community for NF1, where we recognize that for the sponsors to define endpoints is not perhaps as good as if it can be defined by the research community. So this is the response evaluation in neurofibromatosis and schwannomatosis with their mission statement. And um, it includes some um, experts that um, come up with the um, potential endpoints that each of the um, each of the sponsors could use. And I like to point out the patient reported outcomes. And here's a number of re patient reported outcomes, including quality of life, questionnaires, care provider surveys. And the FDA has really paid attention to this ever since um, the last decade. And so for any clinical trial, there should be patient reported outcomes involved. So here's the end of a trial. Is it a home run or are you back to the drawing board? And uh, that's always the big question. And I just wanted to point out, what is the medical genetics? What's, what's um, different about clinical trials when you have um, medical genetics involved? And you can look through here and, and sort of recognize that there's something different about our families as they enter into a, a clinical trial. And I just um, have that listed for you. And I just, um, I'm going to finish real quickly here for examples of clinical trials, just to share with you my personal experience. Um, I started out, my first clinical trial was uh, the extension for the phase two randomized um, crossover placebo trial for MPS1. Um, this turned out to be aldurazime and it, it did get fed um, FDA approved. And then recognizing that these are, um, that, that you can carry these out as a, as a principal investigator. I, I um, was involved in an observational nat natural history of scoliosis trial in NF1. I transitioned on when, once you know some people in the, uh, in the community, they sometimes say, well, if you have a patient that might be eligible, consider opening your site. And this is one that was an open label for intrathecal eloprase for one of our patients um, in the family that lived in our area. I also performed um, or was part of a site um, um, study for phase two, phase three for hyperphagia and, and Prader-Willi syndrome. And as it turns out, um, some trials are terminated early. Um, and this happened to be because of um, side of potential side effects with this compound. And then the finally, my most recent one is the phase one, phase two randomized uh, high dose, low dose with vitamin D in adults with NF1. And I've got, you know, there's about five slides here, but I'm going to scoot on to the to the final point, and that is that um, in clinical trials, what you know, the endpoints help you get to the point where you want to transition to care. And that's the whole goal. So I'll close off with that from the uh, University of Utah and open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Viscato. That was wonderful. Um, just a reminder for attendees to enter questions into the chat. Uh, Dr. Viscato, we already have a couple of questions for you. So I'll go ahead and read those for you. So the first question, uh, which we've gotten a couple of votes for is, how do you get funding for clinical trials of nutritional interventions like vitamins, especially given your recent vitamin D study, it sounds like, when it has to compete with pharma? Well, I guess I, I would say each, each um, protocol is going to be different, okay? It's... Um, and so there's not one answer that fills, fits all. And I, I think the biggest issue when you talk about some of these nutritional components, um, the endpoints are going to be difficult to measure for the most part, unless it's a, a, a metabolic condition that um, you know there's maybe a deficiency or you can enhance the pathway. But I'm not, I guess I'm not convinced that, that um, industry prevents that from happening. They just have no interest. And so, because it's so difficult, the endpoints are difficult, and I suspect the payout to them is, is not going to be as high as if you had an, a, a medication uh, that, that they um, 
is not generic and and they can earn a bit more um you know i'm being i don't know if i'm being too too harsh on industry but but they have so much that they have to to contend with and so then you're left with trying to obtain funding from smaller organizations and it's difficult so the, at least for our vitamin D study, um, we had to go through the um, the FDA. They called it a, an IND. We had to get an IND for it because we were anticipating changing the label if there is a um, if there is a benefit. So so that sort of prevents you from wanting to expend too much time in those kind of studies when you have to get an IND. Exactly true. So thank you. Uh, next question is, how can rural slash underserved patients be equitably involved in these research opportunities? It seems like options are limited outside of large academic centers. That is a, um, a, a great, uh, great item that we deal with a lot when we negotiate with our sponsors, and that is to, to make sure that they, um, that the families are compensated for not just the travel that they do, but the time off from work. And, and it's, it's a negotiation that you need to put in at the beginning of your, your budgetary cycle, because if you, if you don't, if you don't build that into the budget, then sometimes um, we lose families because of the difficulties in, in transporting. But, you know, the, the, you have to keep in mind some of these um, trials are potentially so beneficial that some families will relocate to a place where the site is available and and they're close by. You know, maybe just um, temporarily for for a year or two. But it is it's it's a great issue, and um, especially out here in the West, we have to keep reminding sponsors that it's not just a drive down the down the highway. I would agree. And perhaps one benefit of COVID has been that uh, many sponsors have added the option of telehealth visits for some, some of the clinic visits. So um, yeah. how about uh, another question? And this one uh, involves conflict of interest. What are your thoughts about conflict of interest when a study is lab slash industry sponsored? <clears throat> Each conflict of interest is is going to differ, and I think you just have to to um, I think it's pretty clear when it's a financial um, conflict of interest, and you negotiate those. Those are things that you you clearly have to deal with. But there are times where it's not as obvious, and um, I think sometimes families look at it and say, "Well, they ask the question as the maybe local site PI." What are you getting out of this? You know, why are you investing all of this energy into this? And you have to be quite honest and say, well, that we're getting support from sponsors. They are paying for my time, but make it absolutely clear that that's where the cutoff is. If they're if you have invested in that company, then you better be ready to disclose it. And, and that's true, not just for the families, but of course for your institution. Thank you. What can healthcare slash medical team, e.g. Uh, genetic counselors, provide to the family when presenting information on clinical trials that are available? Well, first off, I would say that um, whoever is, is meeting with that family, just disclose what's available. And, and just knowing that there's something available, and then if there's an interest in the room, if they say, you know, we really want to look into that, or they may say, we'll get back to you, then, then I would say you would serve as the um, intermediary to be sure that you connect them to the right site. And sometimes we are searching out what different sites might somebody go to that's, that's open. Um, it, it's pretty rare that uh, a family might convince you in the room to, why don't you bring that, that trial here to this site? And um, we have done it for a couple of individuals as a, as kind of a one off, but um, that's a big, um, uh, I would say that's a, a big commitment that you'd be making. So what we try to do is really link up the families with the right people that um, potentially could enroll them in a trial and try to seek out the, the trials 
in clinicaltrials.gov, you can see the different locations that trials may be opening in. And so you can select one with talk with the family and say, do you have family members who are um, in that particular location? And sometimes that helps them think through to say, you know, this really is a possibility. Wonderful. And just to answer a quick question out there, one resource that we all use um, and we refer families to is the clinicaltrials.gov website. So there was a question about hooking up for studies with Fragile X, but unfortunately we're sort of out of time at this point. Dr. Viscotchel, thank you very much for your excellent presentation.